happy today to introduce a friend and colleague, uh, Maureen Myers. But uh, before we do that, we'd like to remind everybody that uh, please have your microphones off. Um, put your questions in the chat. I will uh, feed those, uh, serve those up to Maureen when the lecture is over. Uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, Brent Bergen sends his regards. Uh, he's in retirement now, uh, continuing to work at home and excited about the archival work that he's still doing and uh, happy to see that so many people are signing up for the Lunch and Learns. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that uh, next month, our, our friend and colleague Paul Matheny from uh, the State Museum, uh, he is the Director of Collections over there, will be our uh, Lunch and Learn speaker on March 18th at noon, as always. His lecture will be from Catawba to Contemporary, Pottery and Ceramic Arts from the South Carolina State Museum's Collections, which as I understand it, will be a broad talk, uh, but will include uh, some uh, information on uh, Catawba pottery as well. Today, uh, Maureen Myers is our speaker. I've known her for quite some time. Uh, as I was thinking about it, she's really worked in a lot of different realms in archaeology. I know she's worked at the Florida State Museum. Uh, she was at the University of Mississippi, where she became a tenured professor. Uh, I think she's worked a little bit in CRM. And uh, currently, she is the president of the Southeastern Archaeological Conference, uh, which I'm going to contend is one of the biggest, and I could be wrong about that, but it's certainly the best archaeological conference in the country, uh, if not the world, and uh, is, is leading us through the COVID and uh, also working on uh, issues of sexual harassment. And she works with Society of American Archaeology on that as well. Um, today, Maureen's going to talk to us about the Westo Indians who moved into South Carolina uh, back in the 17th century. And the title of her talk is From Refugees to Slave Traders, The Transformation of the Westo. And she is currently a senior archaeologist at uh, New South Associates over in Stone Mountain, Georgia. So please make welcome Dr. Maureen Myers. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It's great to see you and see so many familiar faces and also just to be able to um, share this story with a lot of new people too that I don't, I'm not sure how many people are, are often aware of it. Um, and I also agree that of course that SEAC is the biggest and best conference. So um, I'm always happy to answer questions about SEAC and urge you to join us. Um, we, we like to do some good, um, good archaeology and have fun. So that's how it should be. Um, I'm excited to share with you the story of the Westo, this interesting native group that exemplify the changes to me of the 17th century for both natives and colonists in the North and the Mid-Atlantic and the South. The story of the Westo for me began 21 years ago when I was employed by the Savannah River Archaeological Research Program on a one-year contract to identify the location of contact period sites on SRARP territory uh, near Augusta during the 17th and early 18th century. And at the time I was actually living in Richmond, Virginia and I know it was exactly 21 years ago because uh, this turned out to be a great job for me because I was pregnant with my first daughter, uh, first child who turns 21 tomorrow. So that's hard. It's hard to think it's all it's all happened. <laughs> so um, the interesting thing about Augusta, as many of you know, is that many native groups lived in this area. And I recently published a chapter in an edited volume um, about all of these groups. So that would include uh, groups like the Westo, the Savannah, also known as the Shawnee, the Yamasee, the Yuchi, and many other groups. Um, and that area was used throughout the 17th and 18th century. It's kind of fascinating in and of itself, as many of you know. But today I'm going to focus on the Westo, the first of these outside native groups in the area. And to me, one of the most intriguing, in part because of the lack of archaeological evidence that I'll talk about, and a somewhat, um, I don't even want to say spotty, but interesting documentary record. But to me, the Westo are, are important because they personify the great economic changes that occur at this time. And they show both native and colonial agency. And we know how the story ends because most of you have probably never heard of the Westo, but how we got there is a story that I always think should be really better known. So the Westo, um, slides are moving here. 
The Westo existed in what Robbie Etheridge has termed a shatter zone, um, a region of instability from which shock rate waves radiated out for sometimes hundreds of miles and that was present in the South during the 17th century. Indeed, the effects of this shatter zone may have encompassed the entire Eastern woodlands. It produced militaristic native slaving societies. The strategies of colonists and natives and the effects of these strategies can be clearly seen though in the story of the West. To me, they really exemplify the shatter zone. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, Western origins have been debated since the early 20th century. Uh, Werner Crane first argued that the Westo were the same group known as the Richahecrians, also known as the Rickahawkins, and I'll use those terms interchangeably, who first appeared in Virginia in 1656 along the falls of the James River. And that's the thing that first caught my eye when I first heard about the Westo, because I happen to be living in Richmond, Virginia, but doing this job for the Savannah River plant, they let me work remotely before it was a thing. Um, and so I thought, well, that's really interesting. I'm actually a native Virginian and I've done a lot of archeology span in Virginia. Um, and even 20 years ago, I had done a lot of archeology span in Virginia and I'd never heard of them. And I, so that was really what caught my eye. Crane suggested that they were displaced Northeastern Indians, either Erie or Iroquoian. Carol Mason, um, as far back as 1963, noted that Henry Woodward, who was an a English colonist living in South Carolina, visited the Westo village in 1674, located along the Savannah River. She agreed with Crane that they were probably the same group in Virginia in 1656. When Woodward visited the Westo, um, he described the houses as long structures made of bark. And this is very unlike Southeastern native wattle and daub uh, structures that were really square. Such bark covered longhouses then were common to Northeastern groups. And so people have been wondering for a long time, well, who are the Westo? Eric Baum presented pretty strong evidence that the Westo were displaced Erie. The Erie lived west of the Five Nation Iroquois and were a coalescent society, some of the last to hold out against aggression of the Iroquois. Bound suggests that the Richahecrians were a faction of Erie who moved to Virginia in 1656 and that they settled at the Virginia Fall Line to avoid the Susquehannock found in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. And they settle at the same time as the Erie were pushed out of the Northeast. The Iroquois spent the Iroquois spent much of the mid 17th century um, doing this, um, and I know that's really not a beaver, but I really like the picture. Um, procuring beaver pelts for the latest European fashion beaver hats, shown on the right here. In fact, they overhunted the beaver, um, as later the Yamasee and other groups would overhunt white-tailed deer to meet the large European demand for pelts. Um, so beaver hats were all the rage at this time, and it's, it's a relatively short rage, but it actually lasts a few decades. As a result, the Iroquois are very well armed and they receive guns in exchange for the pelts. They also, however, begin to make incursions into surrounding territories and participated in a native slave trade which actually was described by um, a little known historian known as Al Alfred Lauber. I stumbled into his book when I was doing this research uh, 20 years ago, and he documented this in a 1920s volume. Uh, this ultimately results in what we call the great dispersion of groups at this time shown here. And as you can see, you've got a lot of people dispersing in different ways. And uh, if you're interested in this topic, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but of course, Daniel Richter talks about it, Eric Bound talks about it, and the role of the Morning War um, as well uh, that the Iroquois employed. So in general, for my purposes, I like to focus on the fact that they're overhunting the beaver um, and they keep pushing other groups out of the territory in order to get that beaver. So I have suggested, um, I know that Eric, uh, Eric and I are old friends and, and he, he argues that they're Erie. I've also wondered um, if they were Iroquois. Um, the group who show up at the Falls of the James River, um, which is basically uh, present day Richmond, Virginia, they have guns. Um, Daniel Richter notes that the Iroquois were better armed than the Erie. Second, after the Iroquois defeated the Erie in 1656, the area aren't very numerous, while documents note that the Westo were probably, were possibly as many as a thousand, maybe a little bit more. 
And third, in 1661, I found a document in Virginia that a Jesuit priest recorded the presence of Iroquois warriors in Virginia who had, quote, come to avenge Iroquois warriors killed eight or nine years ago. But ultimately, I, I'm not sure that we know at this point. I think both Eric and I have pretty good evidence to support both of our claims. Um, and so I'm not quite willing to die on this sword. I'm not sure he is either. Um, but we also know that the term Rickahawken was a general term for Northern Indians, which is to say, as I said, I'm not sure if we know if they're Erie, Iroquois, or it's possible they were another native group. And I've looked into this for a while too. They could be Wenro, they could be Huron, they could be neutral. Um, and so it could be any number of North uh, groups that come down to me or come down to Virginia. But just as interesting to me is why this group chose to go south and how did they know where to go? There's actually a fair amount of archaeological and ethnohistoric evidence for the presence of Northern Native groups in Virginia before the mid 17th century, before the Rickahawkins show up. I apologize for the quality of the map, um, but if you're familiar with it, it's John Smith's 1608 map. And it has a couple of interesting things on it. Um, one is a town of Rickahawking as one of four Weepamock villages on the north side of Albemarle Sound. It also notes a town of Rickahawk on the Chick Chickahominy River at the same time. Later in 1621, Smith notes that natives fleeing to Rickahack on the James River which was now, he noted, under the control of Itayatin. Itayatin was the brother and successor of Powhatan, the head of the Confederacy. And another archaeologist a while ago, William Green, suggested that they participated in the 1622 Jamestown Massacre. So we have a long history here of some kind of northern group incursion into this region. And the more I looked into this, I also realized that there might be some archaeological evidence for such a group in the James River region of Virginia. What you're looking at here is what Randy Turner describes as Gaston ware, a ceramic type typical of the upper James River region. It's a sand and crushed quartz tempered type that is pretty much simple stamped as you can see. It was a significant wear in a critical area of the Powhatan chiefdom or the upper reaches of the James River, according to Turner. It's associated with Powhatan, Appomattox, Arahotic, and Weenich groups, who themselves are associated with Iroquoian speaking groups who were located south of the area, including the Nottoway, the Maharan, and the Tuscarora. Turner has suggested that Powhatan, his father, and his brother, Opie Can Canoe, were Pamunkeys from the south or southwest of Jamestown, and that the incorporation of these other groups suggested alliance in the Confederacy, as shown materially, possibly by this presence of Gaston Ware in the region. There's another bit of archaeological evidence for a northern and mid-Atlantic trade connection. Some of that is tied to Shell, which I'm not going to get into as much here, but if you look, if we look at another site known as the Abbeville site, which is actually south of Richmond, uh, southwest at the confluence of the Dan and Stanton rivers, um, we find shell tempered pottery with decorative motifs and pot shapes that was very different from the surrounding Piedmont groups. In addition, though, of interest to me were the presence of copper spirals, and this on your right here is a beaver pelt effigy recovered from graves at this site. There's also a, a fair amount of uh, Dutch beads at the site. Um, the beads and I believe the faunal remains were all analyzed by uh, Heather Lapham, who's now at the University of North Carolina. Um, the copper and the brass spirals and also hoops that were found there are indicative of trade between the North and the South. Beaver pelt effigies are also found at Monongahela, Seneca and Oneida sites and they have, may have been used as counters in the beaver pelt trade. In fact, when the site was excavated, I believe in the late 70s to early 80s, it was later then written up, uh, analyzed and written up by a, a, a group of different Virginia archeologists. Um, this wasn't recognized as a beaver pelt effigy. Um, I forget, it was called something completely different. And it wasn't until I was looking at some Monongahela um, archeological uh, literature that I recognized it, it kind of jumped out at me and I was like, oh, this is what Abbeville is. Um, and it tells us that there were people from the North, native groups from the North coming as far as the confluence of the Dan and Stanton rivers, I think to get beaver. Um, 
So the presence of these beaver pelt, pelt effigies and the Dutch beads at Abbeville indicate a beaver pelt trade was moving south during the early 17th century. We also, as I mentioned, have Chesapeake Bay shells that show up in the north um, at, at burials that um, Martha Sempowski has documented, documented um, at the north, up north at this time period in, in New York. The early 17th century villages we see on Smith's map then may be indicators of both shell procurement sites occupied by Northeast groups, but also beaver pelt uh, procurement sites. Uh, again, William Green suggests that the Westo were acting as middlemen in this marine shell trade soon after they, they arrived in Virginia in 1656, but the beaver pelt effigies and the beaver trade in the North suggest that beaver played a pretty big and active role. So that's a bit of the uh, larger background um, that kind of ties the North and a bit of the Mid-Atlantic or at least um, the Virginia part um, and sets us up to let's return to that Falls of the James River in 1656. And this is what we know from the documentary evidence. These rich Heckrians, who we think later became known as the Westo, and I'm going to talk to you about um, my theory as to how that happened estimated to have numbered around six to 700, possibly a thousand people, and it was men, women, and children, and they settle here. Um, the colonists uh, who had been leery of any natives since the 1622 massacre, decide to organize a militia and solicit aid from the Pamunkeys, who are the largest group in the Powhatan Confederacy. The Pamunkey, though, likely had their own reasons to attack the Rickahawkins, as the documentary record refers to them. They may have been trying to solidify their control of the area south of the James River. The Westo or the Rickahawkins may have also been allied with the Susquehannock, and that may have been enough to promote uh, to provoke the Pamunkeys. So I should, I want to um, deviate a little bit here and talk about a lot of what I just told you was stuff I figured out along the way. In fact, long after I turned in the report to Savannah River Plant. Um, but at the time, as I said, I was living in Richmond. I was fascinated by this. I would go down to the Library of Virginia about once a week. And, and uh, I love the interlibrary loan there. The guy would um, keep feeding me all these documents and different reports and things to read. And uh, I kept asking, um, archaeologists in the Richmond area, do you have you heard of the Westo? No, no one had ever heard of them. Have you heard of the Ricka Hawkins? No. And I said, and the reason we knew about them um, is because the Queen of the Pamunkey later sued for peace, and that it's mentioned in the documentary record um, that these Ricka Hawkins were there. And nobody had ever heard of them. And I'd said, well, have you seen any pottery that looks different? Have you done any excavations? No, no, no. Um, and at one point, I, that's how I found out about the Abbeville site. They said, well, maybe the documentary evidence is wrong and it's the Abbeville site that you need to be looking at. And I thought, well, that's really pretty wrong to go from the James River to the Dan and, and Stanton Rivers. But I, I did go down to, Ab to look at the Abbeville things. In fact, I was at the state site files and they had pulled the Abbeville collections for me to look at. And uh, somebody walked in who I had known. He dug around Virginia for years and years. He's a great archaeologist. His name's Taft Kaiser. And he asked me what I was looking at. He was there for some other reason. And I explained it to him. And he said to me, well, you mean that, that sign about the battle? I said, what sign are you talking about? He said, I think it mentions this group known as the Ricka Hawkins. And I said, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. He said, well, Maureen, it's, it's right down from your office. It must be 10 blocks from your office. So I, 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 I felt awful. I said to the curator, I don't think I need to look at this stuff anymore. I jumped in my car, I drove to my office and I, I rushed up the hill and there was a sign that said, Near this site, uh, the Richaheckrian or Seneca Indians overcame Colonel Edward Hill and killed his ally, Tata Potomoy, the chief of the Pamunkeys in 1656. It felt like a, a sign, I'll tell you that much. Um, put up by the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities in 1924. Sign still there. Um, and uh, I thought, I think I, think I found it <laughs> or something. Um, so the, what the sign is telling us is about a battle known actually as the Battle of Bloody Run, and it occurred at the Rickahawken settlement on the James. The English and the Pamunkey militia, led by Colonel Edward Hill, made their way to the Richaheckrian settlement. 
literally the documents state that the English stopped to take a nap. I always like that little detail. The Pamunkey, who were coming from a slightly different direction, different path, and were led by Tatapatamoy, um, didn't know that the English allies had stopped to take a nap and continued on and attacked the town. The Richahecrians drove them back. Remember that they are armed with guns. Um, and in the fray, they actually killed Tatapatamoy. They actually beheaded him, put his head on a stake, and the creek in which they, um, they fought uh, became known as Bloody Run or the Battle of Bloody Run, um, which was known as early as 1924, remembered as early as that and put up. So there might uh, notice the, the um, here in 1924, they thought these were Seneca Indians. Again, uh, that rich Ahekrian term is a generic term for Northern Indians in Virginia. And I think that's what they relied on at that point. So this creek near the battle, as I said, became known as the Battle of Bloody Run. Now, at this point, I had been living in Richmond a couple of years. I'd never heard of Bloody Run. I think that would have kind of popped out to me. Um, and you can see where it is here, um, the Falls of the James. This is a 19th century map. Um, and historic maps of Richmond use that name until this is the, um, the latest map I could find that had that name on it. But then what happened is development. They built a rather fancy part of town, which is now a lovely historic district known as Church Hill, which has a St. Patrick's Cathedral, one of the oldest um, uh, churches in the region, and it has a really fun St. Patrick's Day festival every year. Um, and so it probably doesn't help to sell fancy houses uh, right near the Battle of Bloody Run or Bloody Run itself. So the name changes, which is interesting. To go back to 1656, however, upon arriving at the scene, the English militia retreated, evidently wanting to avoid the same fate of the, as the Pamunkey, likely. And 20 years later, as I've sort of mentioned, they came to regret this. Uh, the queen of the Pamunkey used the British failure at the battle and then a lack of compensation for the loss of Tadapatamoy uh, um, and for other Pamunkey losses to refuse aid to the colonists during Bacon's rebellion. And also I also want to note that the Pamunkey were uh, the only um, native group to join the Virginia colonists in attacking the Richahecrians. And this reflects the changing nature of 17th century native politics. During the early 1600s, the Pamunkey were the dominant native group in Virginia's coastal plain. This culminated, of course, under the leadership of Powhatan, who forged the Powhatan Confederacy. After his death, his brother, Opican Canoe, on the left succeeded him, but he died in 1644. Um, and in 1646, his successor, Nakatawans, was known as King of the Indians, shown on the right here. Um, and he signed a treaty that ceded much of the territory to the English. In 1649, he was succeeded by Tadapatamoy, who was now, now known as the King of the Indians. But the King, it was, I'm sorry, he was now, no longer known as the King of the Indians, but the King of the Pamunkey, and he was now an English ally. His death left a vacuum in the region that was filled by militarized slaving groups like the Rickahawkins. So, that's the battle that happens, but how do the Rickahawkins become the Westo? And that became one of the questions I ended up asking. So following the battle, the Virginia government sued for peace. The colony wanted to open trade with interior Indians and some aspiring leaders or traders saw, their, um, saw that their chance at this point. So that failed militia leader, Edward Hill, was replaced by the trader, Abraham Wood, and in doing so, the council who, who made this replacement designated Woods residence along the Appomattox River as one of only three places the Indians would be allowed to trade. However, uh, closer, and I should say too that Eric Bounds um, suggested that Wood was a person, the person that set up a trade with the Rick Hawkins. But uh, I started to look a little bit closer at um, the location of the falls um, and it suggests there may have been some other interested parties. There was a man named Thomas Stegg. Um, Thomas Stegg II owned a plantation at the Falls of the James in 1656. This plantation is, was known as both Belvedere and the Falls Plantation. And in fact, you can still visit it Belvedere today. 
It's located immediately below present day Mayo Bridge, if you've ever been to Richmond, and directly across the river from, the, from Bloody Run where the battle was. He inherited his property from his father, who was a successful merchant, and Steg Jr. expanded it, and in doing so, he earned a place on the Virginia Council. He died in 1671, and when he died, he was, where he was known as a very successful Indian trader with uh, native trading partners to the south and actually as far as Western North Carolina. He also had no heirs. And in 1670, he convinced his nephew, someone you may have heard of, William Byrd I, um, to come from England and assist him in his business. Byrd inherited it upon Stegg's death and extended it into the interior about 400 miles ultimately into the, with the Catawba and the Cherokee. He also added to his land holdings on the James. By 1673, his plantation at the Falls was an active trading post with caravans of up to 15 men and 100 pack horses and a well-known trading path emerged there as far as South Carolina. Although I have no found no account stating that he actually traded Indian slaves, he did own them. And later he imported one of the first uh, African slave ships in Virginia at Chaco Bottom. Abraham Wood and Byrd were acquaintances and they were likely rivals and both served on the Virginia Council between 1655 and 1670. So they would have been very well aware of the battle and would have put Hill in charge and replaced him with Wood. Um, along with Steg, there was a trading family known as um, of, uh, a man named Theodoric Bland on the left um, and also Edward Hill. These are your main Indian traders in the region. Uh, some through documentary evidence, I identified that Wood and Hill formed a trading partnership and that the Blands and Stag and Bird appear to have formed a second trading partnership. These were very common at the time. By the time of the 1656 Richahecrian intrusion at the falls, the junior Stag had an advantage because of his location, whereas Wood and Hill would have been disadvantaged um, in part because of Hill's activities during the battle, his actions during the battle, and then also because Wood was actually on the Appomattox, not the James River. Also in 1656, there were intermittent trade restrictions with natives in place since the 1622 massacre. And these became lifted in 1656. Remember all these guys are on the council, they would have been the ones to lift that. In conjunction with this though, specific Indians were granted a trade license that stipulated who they were trading with. So that was the new law. If you were gonna trade with Indians, the Indians had to hold a pass that stated who you were trading with. So I have speculated that if Steg and Bland were allies, and if they established trade relations with the Richahecrians, it's possible that the name of one of their plantations would be on that license. So not just the name of one trader, you have a partnership of multiple traders, so you might put the plantation on the license. One of the plantations, actually William Byrd, who would have been allied with Stag and Bland, it was bought in 1688, but had first belonged to Theodoric Bland before William Byrd bought it in 1688. This plantation, which you can still visit today, it's quite lovely, is known as the Westover Plantation or just Westover. And I suggest that the name Westo is a shortened version of Westover as written on a trade agreement. The first recorded use of the name is in 1670 when the British encounter natives of Charleston warning them about the Westo. And I should take a, another a little aside here. I'd love to say that this was my idea, but it wasn't. Um, I really have to give credit to archeologist Marvin Jeter's wife who happened to go to a SEAC and happened to um, sit in on a paper. Uh, she's, I don't believe she's an archeologist. It's the only time I've ever met her. Um, and she uh, listened to the paper and afterwards came up to me and she, she was holding a book in her hand. She said, this is William Byrd II's uh, diary. And I, they're all published. Everyone, you know, you can get a book and read them. She said, but the, the plantation name I just noted is Westover. You might want to look into that. And I was like, oh, huh. <laughs> and I did. And so I did find the documentary evidence that she presented to kind of to back that up. Um, I want to also further suggest that in exchange for native slaves from the South, the Westo received guns and ammunition from Byrd and his associates. 
This trade partnership, if it existed, would have provided some protection from, say, the competing Okanichi, who were actually aligned with Bird's competitor, Abraham Wood. And this competition may have spurred the rich Ahekrians, now known as the Westo, to move south to abstain, obtain native slaves as early as 1659. And in fact, uh, we think, and we being uh, Robbie Etheridge and I, um, it appears that the Westo and a few others of us, um, they appear to have been the first native group to show up with guns in the Southeast. So they would have been a militarized slaving society. They would have been rather um, uh, frightening, right, to other natives in the Southeast who may not have, especially in the interior, may not have um, seen so many guns uh, owned by natives. So most scholars agree that the rich Hecrians moved to the Savannah River to raid the Spanish mission Indians and the low country groups. They settled on the Savannah near present day Augusta. John Lederer accounted, encountered rich Hecrians on Okanichi Island in 1672, but they may also be the same group that John Worth notes uh, uh, and calls the, or that they were known as the Chichimecos, Chichimecos, who raided and displaced Indian groups north of Florida as early as 1661. The Southern groups, um, Southern native groups began fleeing to interior Spanish missions to escape Westo slavers, but raiding of the missions by the Westo continued into the 1660s. So Worth states that interior Georgia actually became what he calls a vast buffer zone between the musket bearing Chichimecos on the Savannah River and their missions on the Southeast Georgia coastline. By 1670, then, then you have the local Kusabo natives greet the English when they land at Charleston and say, English are our friends, the Westo are not. Um, in fact, the Kusabo later tell the English that they think that the Westo are cannibals because they keep taking people and they never see them again. And so if you think, um, I mean, so they made quite an impression, but I all, I'm also just astounded by the Westo who are obviously from the Northeast, they, you know, stop in Virginia, they route the, the Pamunkey, they set up a pretty good trading partnership, they make their way to Augusta, they settle, um, they're in a, a new territory to them, they don't know the language, they, but they have weapons, and they start going back and forth, probably with the native slaves, um, back up to per Bird's Plantation at Westover, trading the slaves and then coming back down with more guns. And they do this rather successfully for probably 15 or 20 years. Um, although they anger the Okanichi along the way because they're kind of cutting into some of that trade as well. After the 1670s, although, however, other groups begin to compete with the Westo. The Okanichi even kill some Westo in their own town in 1670. After Charlestown was established, um, the Westo decide to secure a trade agreement with the guy on the left here, Henry Woodward, another fascinating colonial character, um, in order to open trade relations with the English in South Carolina. Now, why all of a sudden within the 1670s, the Westo want to start to open trade relations with the English in South Carolina? Um, and I'm going to get into that in just a second. Um, I mean, one thing could have just been it would have been closer, not so much travel, not so much interaction with the Okanichi. So they could have gotten guns and ammo without the cost of transporting slaves to Virginia. However, the Westo dominance actually ends when a group of Charlestown planters known as the Goose Creek men, and you may be familiar, you can still see Goose Creek, South Carolina today, staged a trade coup against the Lord Proprietors. And so the Lord Proprietors are the ones that um, are the landed gentry. They tell Woodward to go out there and secure this partnership. Before he can do that, the, the everyday planters um, decide, okay, no, we, we don't want the Westo here anymore. We don't want the Lord Proprietors to benefit from this. We want in on this. And they actually hire the Savannah, also known as the Shawnee, to come down from the north and annihilate them and open trade into the interior. And John Marcuse's work on this, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, is, is sort of that story on the Savannah and the Shawnee. By 1682, there's only about 50 Westo warriors remaining. And by 1715, they appear to disappear, they appear gone from the documentary record. They go 
they actually go west to Macon to the uh, trading post there and appear to join the creek at that point. Um, although if anybody is aware of other documentary evidence, I'm all ears. Um, it's hard to find them after 1715. So I want to say, although it's easy to blame the demise of the Westo on the South Carolina British, these planters, I suggest that larger colonial forces in Virginia also contributed to their demise. Beginning in the 1650s, and lasting into the 1670s, the Virginia Council uh, passed several laws to regulate trade, especially with regard to armed natives. In 1662, a law was passed that prohibited trade with Northern Indians. And while this limited Westo competition, and note they were seen, um, interestingly, they would have been seen as a, now as Southern rather than Northern Indians. Um, although at the same time, they're building longhouses along the Savannah River. The sale of arms was prohibited with all natives by 1665. So they're, you know, it's becoming too costly to go north. In 1676, uh, another thing happens, an increasing number of Indian raids that actually precipitate something you may have heard of, Bacon's Rebellion. This rebellion is often cited by historians as the first American rebellion against the English crown that precipitates the American Revolution. I started to look again a little closer at the documentary evidence. And I'm not so sure that's quite the story. And so Nathaniel Bacon was also a planter, not the landed gentry. Um, and he was fairly new to the Indian trade. And he owned property in Henrico County, which is where present day Richmond is, including some property at the falls of the James River. In September 1675, the Susquehannock raided several plantations and farmsteads, including, interestingly, very specifically, that of uh, Nathaniel Bacon and William Byrd. They killed Bacon's overseer, actually, and at least one of Byrd's servants. The consequences of these actions ultimately become Bacon's rebellion. In April 1676, Byrd, Bacon, and others discussed the governor's ineptitude, quote, in the face of a much feared combination of Indians from New England to the Chesapeake. Their fear, though, may not have been so much all Indians, but rather those from the North that would disrupt their trade. In fact, they, have appeared of, um, they may have taken advantage of Susquehannock hostilities to break the Okonichi monopoly of the Virginia trade much like the Goose Creek men would later break the Westo trade. And although Bacon threatened all Indians, curiously, those who, who, had, who he attacked were the Oganichi, the enemy and recent murderers of the Westo. And then as the rebellion proceeds, he attacked the Pamunkey, who had earlier already gotten into it with the Westo. His men also attacked other Indian traders, including failed bloody run militia leader, um, Edward Hill who was despised by the poor farmers who made up the majority of Bacon's forces. In fact, they even beat his pregnant wife with a cane. Um, so these seem to be very personal attacks um, that I think we've overlooked a little bit in the documentary evidence. Um, and one result of Bacon's rebellion for groups like the Westo was a clear message that natives would no longer control the trade. If there was a partnership, as I've suggested, with Stagg, Bird, and, and Hill, and Wood, these things began to unravel. Stagg died in 1671. Bird actually moved to Westover, which was a little bit farther away from the falls, and he becomes more engaged in African trade, um, African slave trade. Hill was disgraced by Bacon's men, and Wood kind of fades from the scene. Bird and Wood focused on native trade with Cherokee and Catawba, and Bird's Shaco Bottom Warehouse becomes an African slave trading venue, um, which is actually really the beginnings of the African slave trade for that mid-Atlantic area. These circumstances together combined with the Goose Creek men signal the demise of the Westo. And so in closing, I wanna highlight some of the scant archeological evidence we have of the Westo in Virginia and in South Carolina. In Virginia, the location of Bloody Run was, as I've already mentioned, kind of forgotten by the early 20th century. And it's located also in this fancy part of Richmond known as Church Hill. Uh, the creek um, shown here is um, actually now unnamed. And it also, uh, I found out pretty quickly, overlooks a Superfund site. So uh, sadly, excavation is, is somewhat unlikely. 
Uh, the site of the Ricka Hawkins is either here or likely under the existing city of Richmond, although excavations of the city are not known and could identify some evidence of it. I would suspect this would include evidence of some kind of longhouse like structure and some kind of foreign looking pottery and, and maybe other items as well. In South Carolina, we've also made some attempts to identify the West Coast settlement. Um, Chad Braley and, uh, and Lewis uh, looked for it in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Chad shared these with me a long time ago, um, but we're ultimately unsuccessful. It could be also though that the shovel test didn't go deep enough, but as I recall, they did go pretty deep. Um, before his death, uh, Charlie Hudson, who always was very supportive of my work here, um, was also looking to, into possible locations. And I realized the other day that I think the last time I saw Charlie, he, he was, he'd come to my house for some lunch and had brought all these maps with him and pointed me in the direction of a cemetery in Augusta known interestingly as Westover Memorial Park um, since 1912. And he just thought, well, this is interesting and I should look into it. And I have looked into it. It appears to be a dead end. I'm not sure I've exhausted all the sources there. Um, other uh, information that Charlie and I looked at um, in the most likely location, which is based on uh, Woodward's notes, is that it might be um, actually located on, I think it's the ninth green of the present day Augusta golf course. Um, again, unlikely to be found, but if anybody has any kind of sway and um, wants to try to convince them to dig up their golf course, I'm all for it. So um, archaeologically, it feels that we're at a dead end, although I've said this both archaeologically and documentary wise for the Westo for 21 years now, and every time somebody, I tend to give a talk like this, and somebody says, you know, you should look at this, and it turns out to be something, so I'm always excited that that, that could happen. Um, so I think, though, as I said at the beginning, the West are important because of the role they play in the 17th century, both colonial and native politics. They navigate this complicated system that includes impose, opposing factions of English colonists in South Carolina and Virginia, Spanish missions, multiple native groups, consider what they had to encounter, the Susquehannock, the Okanichi, the Pamunkey, and then Southeastern groups as well. This spans the Eastern seaboard, and for a short time, they do it very successfully. They also, to me, exemplify the results of class warfare during this um, you know, colonial period, both um, between what happens uh, at Bacon's Rebellion and with the Goose Creek men. And, and that story, of course, is used to fuel the American Revolution. They persevere until they are outnumbered and likely outgunned. They are, to me, a critical part of American history. And I just want to say thank you for letting me share it with you. And, and thanks to a lot, an awful lot of people that, um, that assisted. Thanks.